Um, especially nice to see secondary school students here. Um, this morning, this is the third time I've been here. Thank you to uh, Professor Watson and Solisis for having the IGDS. Um, and in the past, have discussed data and some other things, which I'll do today. But because it's International Women's Day, I really want to speak today as an activist. And with the theme of Be Bold for Change, uh, guiding International Women's Day, I really want to speak about some of the risks of this work uh, and uh, the challenges that we face doing it. When we do this work publicly, people think that what you're getting is the front stage appearance and representations that you hear on radio and television, but they don't realize the kinds of challenges around strategizing, around backlash, and I feel like it's important today as we move ahead to share some of that. And so um, this is a bit of a, a slightly tongue-in-cheek uh, um, uh, question, do women's lives matter? I actually thought it was tongue-in-cheek at first, but then I heard on I-95 this morning a serious call-in question. Did anyone hear it? Um, yes, men and women are different. Does that mean we should be equal, right? Which, <laughs> uh, um, which ironically came right after they uh, collaborated with the IGDS to uh, create statements for International Women's Day. So the question of, in, of equality in women's lives may not be so tongue in cheek after all. And if you're a young woman, uh, or indeed a young man, or another generation, and you are encouraged to be passionate about being involved in social change, it's important to know that it's not easy work, and uh, that, uh, you know, there's a lot to learn about strategizing um, as you're doing it. So um, I want to discuss some of that today. Now, uh, I'll read this. It is the uh, title for the upcoming march being organized by Single Fathers Association of Trinidad and Tobago. It says, we men are against all violence from all to all. Um, and Rondell Fields, who's the head of the organization, writes, why are so many public advocates intent on separating the issue to deal with domestic violence against women only. When statistics have shown that both children and men are victims of the same. Are we saying violence in the home is unacceptable to one party but acceptable to everyone else in the family? Um, now, first of all, nobody separates the issue. We bring a gender analysis. Secondly, I'm going to show statistics that suggest that it's not quite that statistics show that things are the same. And thirdly, no one is saying that violence against some is unacceptable, but violence to others is, right? But these things get circulated in the press, they're given airtime, and people accept them as valid positions. So. I just ask, uh, you know, is this the equivalent? And we've we've kind of been thinking about how to phrase this, and you know, we're quite familiar with the um, with the global campaign to highlight um, violence against, uh, particularly state violence against um, black folk in the Americas. Um, and so I ask, is this the equivalent of an all lives matter response to a Black Lives Matter campaign? Um, is this the equivalent of saying, how come you're not taking account of black and black violence instead of police violence? How come you're uh, not considering other categories of victims, LGBT folk, immigrants, um, and others? And what is the value of bringing up violence um, against women, by women, at this moment? So you'll hear that, oh, well, in violence against women, by women, is increasing. But what's at stake? in saying these things, right? And we have to treat them as not ideologically neutral, right? They're part of a larger backlash that passes under our radar. Um, and I wanna ask, at this time when women are being murdered in increasing numbers, and we saw the numbers, and when the majority of those cases are related to intimate partner violence, when women and men have been calling for an end to violence against women, not only in domestic violence offenses, but also in relation to sexual violence as it affects women traveling by taxi, street-based sexual harassment, workplace harassment, as they all affect women in the public sphere. Why in this moment focus on campaigning against violence by all, against all? What's gained in pre presenting activists as biased or turning a blind, blind eye, or separatist, or indeed as excluding men. 
What's at stake in calling for a focus on psychological and emotional violence, for example, when the severity of injury and indeed death show inequality in terms of harm? What's at stake in focusing on violence by all when all are not equally perpetrating violence in all its severity, nor is the harm and indeed rates of murder from domestic violence offenses equal either. Right? So what happens when you begin to flatten what the data actually suggest in order to invisibilize inequalities that exist? So I ask this, but I, I do want to keep, you know, just remind you that the Black Lives Matter campaign was, has always been led. There have been black women who have been at the forefront. I don't want to separate the issues of black women's lives from larger issues or see them women's issues. And in this case, Black Lives Matter campaign is separate. And some of you may be familiar with the Say Her Name campaign that sought to also raise awareness of the way that black women were also experiencing police violence but may have been receiving less visibility, right? But I thought this was a good way to raise it because many of us are familiar with this, right? We're familiar with the importance of why you're called in this out, so I'm using a shortcut to get to, um, to get get you imagine what happens when an all lives matter campaign then seeks to diminish a particular urgency and immediacy and an extremity of violence that's being unequally experienced. In that campaign, the Black Lives Matter campaign, for example. The point wasn't to suggest that black lives should be or were more important than other lives. All lives matter, obviously, and I am against injustice and murder across the board. Indeed, in that campaign, it was simply pointing out that black people's lives were relatively undervalued, are relatively undervalued, and that the country needed to recognize that inequity in order to bring an end to it. And there's something else that matters, you know, in the backlash to violence against women as separatist, right, as articulating as separatist, and that is context. What we're doing is, is articulating a focus, not an exclusion. In a culture where women and men have not yet made intimate relationships a site where women are safe, in this context, it is a cruel distortion of reality to scold activists for not being inclusive enough particularly when men's movements have not offered the kind of solidarity men need before undercutting the importance of violence against women with the idea that all are violent against all, except the data doesn't actually show that. What does the, uh, what does the data show? Now, before I get to the data, there is something else I also want to point out to you, right? Which is that this idea that we must focus on violence by all against all is not quite as innocent as it appears. It's what we call a move to innocence. Because what happens is that you say we want to focus on violence against all, but there's then a displacement. Yes, but, it, but what about men? And then you get things articulated such as the real sexism. The real sexism is that the victims are men. This is also posted on the SFAT page. In fact, they said to me, what is my fa our favorite feminist, Gab, Gab Hosang, going to say, right? Men are being discriminated in education, the law, society, losing children, dying, and having lives destroyed because of real sexism. Sexism against the Western, in the Western world result, results in hurt feelings. Sexism against men destroys lives and is often lethal. So a, a very subtle displacement is taking place. First, it's separatist to focus on violence against women. Let's focus on all. But let's focus on where the real violence is because it's not actually really happening to violence against women, right? And in that is a call also for seeing programs that have been dedicated to women um, and uh, uh, to either their economic empowerment or shelters or so on, as in fact discriminatory, not taking account of the fact that no programs have ever adequately been able to deal with the problem, which is why it continues to exist as it has today. Now, I do want to say some things, which is that men do face violence in intimate um, partner relationships. Um, the the child line data, um, not the child line data, I'm sorry, the uh, calls to um, 800 save which is uh, uh, crisis calls um, uh, suggest that uh, um, although 80 percent 87 percent of the calls were made by women and 13 percent by men 
And although 81% of the women were calling about intimate partner violence, 62% of men were calling about intimate partner violence, right? So I want to acknowledge that this is an issue that men experience. However, I do want to point to the fact that the fact that women uh, face a larger scope and scale of violence than is norm um, that is normalized by society. And I want to go back to scale and scope um, after. Women do use violence against partners, typically resulting from the need for self-protection or to seek remedy for past violence. And these women are often battered themselves. And also we know that violence is committed at very high levels against women because they are women. The same is not true for men. It is also the case with sexual violence, which are the most underreported crimes globally. So men are facing violence indeed, but in very different contexts and with very different motivations. So for example, a fundamental question that must be examined is who is doing what to whom and with what impact. And though we acknowledge that women can be violent in relationships, research reveals distinctive differences in motivations, intent, and impact of their use of force. So for example, women's use of force has been seen to refer to physical use of force refers to physically, verbally, and emotionally detrimental behaviors, which are used to gain short-term control uh, in situations. Battering, by contrast, which is repetitive, as uh, Professor Hutchinson's data shows, repetitively experienced by a category of persons, signifies a pattern of control, intimidation, and oppression, effectively used to instill fear and maintain long-term relationship domination. Domestic violence by women and men show distinctly different patterns. Although women are violent in domestic situations, often at levels of severity similar to that in men, the impact of their violence is typically less than that of men's violence. This is measured by things like emergency check-ins uh, check in the hospital, uh, reports of injury, and so on. Women tend to commit violence less frequently than do men, and for different reasons. Specifically, men tend to initiate physical assault when motiva motivated by a need of, for self-protection or retaliation of a previous assault by their partner. And men tend to identify control or punishment of women as the primary motivations for their assaults on their partners. If a woman is hurting a man, the violence usually ends when the relationship ends. If a man is hurting a woman, the violence generally escalates and becomes most dangerous when the relationship ends. So there are different patterns at stake here. And when women who use violence do so uh, in self-defense, it's often those women who have the fewest other options for addressing violence against them. Men use power, control, and force as part of intimidating and instilling fear. Uh, women's motivations may include a desire to defend their self-respect against emotional or verbal attacks, event, defend children, a refusal to be victimized again, and so on. Given this, given this picture, right, which I want to complicate that all violence against all by all, how do we get men to speak out about their own experiences, whether as perpetrators or as victims, and also their solidarity with ending violence against women while not re resorting to the backlash of an All Lives Matter campaign. Uh, and this is another quote from Rondell Fields. Domestic violence isn't only women in the home, but when you continue to talk about domestic violence and not include male victims, you exclude the male victims who don't feel safe to make reports and feel justified in taking things into their own hands. In other words, a focus that reflects data Right. is read as exclusion and as justification for backlash of various kinds without acknowledging why this focus exists or why acting in solidarity and finding ways to do so may be a better strategy. So just to conclude on what the data suggests, women are at more risk than men. Now, I want to say something about the insufficiency of the data. As Professor Hutchinson um, and others would know, and certainly the Assistant Police Commissioner, um, we don't get perpetrator data, right? And that's a problem. And I'll show why um, in, in one of my last slides. Now, that means that when Single Fathers Association says 44% of the DV deaths um, are men, the assumption is that those deaths are being caused by women, 
right? And I don't think that that is correct, but without perpetrator data, it is impossible for us to counter that kind of backlash. So gender blind data works against the ability of advocates to properly analyze and educate about how gender equality works in domestic violence cases. And citing murders without perpetrators hides the truth while calling on feminists to be honest about it, right? But there is not equivalency. We are not seeing 44% of men dying in domestic violence cases at the hands of women, okay? Why do the numbers therefore matter in terms of categories of experience? Okay, so let me just explain a bit of what's going on here. In terms of murders, 56, this is between 2010 and 2016, 56% of the murders in domestic violence cases were women and 44% were men, right? So I get that, and that's what's gonna be uh, circulating on your newsfeed. Let me tell you what's not gonna be circulating on the newsfeed and which really needs to, if you're actually interested in ending violence against all by all, which is that in the same period, 100% of the reports for sexual offenses were by women. 80% of assault and beating reports were by women. 82% of breach of protection orders were by women. 66% of threats, right, reports of threats were by women. And 72% of verbal abuse, right, were reports by women. So I wanna complicate that 56% of deaths in domestic violence cases, 44% of deaths in domestic violence cases. And you need to record the perpetrator because when you don't, remember the perpetrator could be a cousin, uncle, brother, aunt, it could be anybody in that domestic household, not necessarily women, but it's being used in anti-feminist backlash to really undermine the necessary work that we do on the basis of data by arguing that women are indeed not only as violent as men, but more violent than men, and in fact are causing more harm when the data does not show this, right? And I raise this, you know, because to be honest, this is the difficulty of doing this work in the Caribbean. You make one step forward, you make two steps back, and it's because inaccurate kinds of uh, interpretations of data circulate and get picked up by well-meaning people. Now, let me just tell you what some Caribbean perceptions of uh, violence against women are to kind of bring all of this home. In a Jamaican reproductive health survey of 2008, Jamaican women were more than twice as likely as their peers from Latin America to agree that women have an obligation to have unwanted sex with their husband. In the same survey, 48.6% survey of Jamaican women and 55% of Jamaican men said that a good wife should obey her husband even if she disagrees. And two out of every five Jamaican men, or 40%, said that it was important for a man to show his wife or partner who is the boss. One in four approve of a husband hitting his wife if she neglects her household chores. And Caribbean men were significantly more likely than women to approve of a man hitting his wife for being unfaithful. Now, now interestingly, the numbers were lower in Trinidad and Tobago than they were in Ghana and Suriname, so there were regional differences to pay attention to. But on average, men were also more likely to understand 31% of men and 25% of women when women were beaten for leaving or for seeking to leave, or for seeking alternate relationships, something we know quite well from the headlines. Factors associated with tolerance of intimate partner violence include age, younger age, lower income, and a history of experiencing or witnessing violence in your family or in your home. Um, and this was true for both women and men. I wanna say that it, if women matter, the data suggests the reduction in violence experienced by women also comes as a result of women being able to challenge the acceptability of violence, to push for better treatment, to encourage and enable women to leave violent behavior and to raise awareness on the issue in their communities. Violence must be ended. I do not think that it can be reduced to an apolitical, interpersonal, emotional intelligence issue alone. I think that widespread beliefs and values and institutional practices and failures that uphold current notions of masculinity must be acknowledged. That is just the ideological reality that we are dealing with in our lives which harm both women and men. Where they harm women, they dehumanize men. They harm families, they harm boys and girls.
I think invisibilizing these is not solidarity, and I especially want to say so on International Women's Day. And speaking about being for everybody while engaging with backlash politics is also not sol solidarity. And I want to end today by saying, you know, if women's lives matter, and women's lives do matter, we have to see through what they call post-truth perspectives. We have to see through alternate facts. We have to see through representations that trivialize the severity of the issue because of an ideological agenda to minimize it, not deal with it, and indeed try to substitute other priorities when we know that these continue to be ones that should be high on our agenda. Thank you.